Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to greet you on the first day of this event to discuss the importance of the ability to master multiple languages. My name is Manuela Sato Prinz and I work on behalf of the German Academic Exchange Service at its Tokyo office and at Keio University. The German Academic Exchange Service, or DAD as we call it, is the world's largest funding organization for the international exchange of students and researchers. Since it was founded in 1925, more than 2 million scholars in Germany and abroad have received the DAD funding. The DAD also supports the internationalization of German universities or promotes German studies and the German language at universities abroad. Yes, uh, hello everyone and a warm welcome also from my side. My name is Matthias von Gehlen and I'm working at Goethe Institute Tokyo. Um, a short um, uh, notice on uh, what the Goethe Institute uh, does. Um, Goethe Institute is the cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, with a global reach, we promote knowledge of the German language abroad and foster international cultural cooperation. Our cultural and educational programs encourage intercultural dialogue and enable cultural involvement. So this is very well uh, in line with the spirit of uh, this symposium, which emphasizes the benefits of a plurilingual approach and of the interaction of individuals with the use of multiple languages in our societies. This event is uh, jointly organized by the DAD and the Goethe Institute, and it has been made possible thanks to our strong partnerships with the Confucius Institute at JF Oberlin University, the uh, Institut Francais de Japon and the French Embassy, uh, the Institute of Cervantes Tokyo, and the Korean Cultural Center, the Japan Forum, and uh, the Japan Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, JAPTFUL, have also contributed to bringing this event to fruition. So uh, we are very grateful for the tremendous cooperation and support provided by all the participating countries in enabling us to make this event reality. We believe that communication is the key factor to successful globalization. Understanding each other's language not only helps uh, strengthen personal career goals, but also has benefits in creating an open society. Those of you who registered for this event in advance had the opportunity to listen to five plenary talks about five different aspects of multilingualism. You will, as the audience, be encouraged in certain parts of the events to ask questions and give comments. And you can do so through Mentimeter. Uh, a link to Mentimeter is posted on your social media channel. And um, if you want to listen to this symposium in Japanese, please tune in to one of our institution's Twitter channels. And if you prefer the English version, the English version is uh, available uh, through our Facebook pages. So uh, the one of the Gato Institute or the AD. And now we are very, very honored to welcome the ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, Ms. Ina Lepel, to offer a few remarks to kick off this symposium for us. So thank you very much for joining us. I will now hand over our virtual microphone to you, Mrs. Lepel. Dear language enthusiasts, Chair expert on material linguistic, Minasama Komawa, Kikoyamaska. It is my honor to be speaking to you on the occasion of the International Symposium of the Foreign Language Teaching and Learning Research, which, thanks to the efforts of so many of our partners, will be taking place today and tomorrow. The central question of the symposium is, what are the benefits of learning multiple languages? And as a language enthusiast myself, I am very pleased that along with Mr. Ono Kenji from the Office for the Promotion of Foreign Language Education, I have been given the opportunity to open this very interesting symposium today. In my opinion, this event demonstrates the most comprehensive benefit of language learning in its very essence. It connects people and it connects cultures. In this case, it has created synergies among five quite different languages. Having lived and worked in several countries during my career with the German Foreign Ministry, I have learned early on that learning and speaking the host country's language, even if only at a basic level, is not only important for linguistic communication, but is of immense importance on its intercultural level. Speaking a counterpart's language is a sign of respect for their culture, and it provides unique insights into their culture and mentality. In the last 30 years that I have actively dealt with language learning, I would say that learning multiple languages has become easier. 
Much research has gone into improving teaching methods with a focus on practical communication skills and developing meaningful standards of proficiency. Cultural institutes like yours have made important contributions in this regard. Still, really mastering a foreign language remains a struggle with many ups and downs. I feel that the rewards are very worth it, and I get the same sense from DIAD alumni who tell me that immersing themselves in the German language and finally being able to talk to Germans in German was an important part of their education and personal development. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe is known to have said, he who does not know, know a foreign language knows nothing of his own. This I have found to be equally true. Learning a new language forces one to reflect on one's own language. Proverbs and idioms that we use without any deep thought suddenly appear in a new light. In Germany and English, for example, having a scratchy throat, one complains about a frog in the throat, while in French, one blames it on a cat in the throat. And even if people never go abroad or maybe just as tourists, learning multiple language helps them to widen their horizon and to build a society in their own country that is welcome to foreigners and open to the global world. Of course, these are just some observations from my experience as a student of Thai, Urdu, and most recently Japanese. It will be really interesting to listen to the experiences of Mr. Kawashima Eji, member of the Japanese national football team, and other participants, and of course, the opinions of the experts. I wish all of us two informative days with many stimulating panels, and I'm looking forward to the findings presented at the closing event. Thank you very much for your attention. I am very sorry for that. So thank you, Madam Ambassador, for your welcoming remarks. We are very glad that Max, the Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, is joining us today as well for this two-day symposium. I would now like to hand over to Mr. Ono, who is the Director of the Office for the Promotion of Foreign Language Education in the Primary and Secondary Education Bureau at Max. Mr. Ono has long experience in the field of education policy and was previously an advisor at the Washington DC office of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Welcome, Mr. Ono. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. I am Kenji Ono, Director, Office of the Promotion of Foreign Language Education, Primary and Secondary Education Bureau at Ministry of Education. I'm in charge of foreign language education at primary and secondary education. I'm honored to be invited to the symposium attended by experts in language education and researchers and students in foreign language education. I would like to share with you some of the initiatives being rolled out by the Ministry of, Ministry of Education. Allow me to put up my presentation. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm afraid that you activities have been strict, restricted to a great detail this year. It can, however, be an opportunity to reorganize the importance of communication, especially an area of high potential is virtual interactions online using IT and ICT. However, rapid development of ICT has led to a school of thought that 
the device of translation can probably or possibly get rid of the need to learn foreign languages. So I would like to share with you today and think with you against this backdrop to explore the significance of learning foreign languages. Let me first share with you the roles of the schools. Cross-border movement of people, information, and goods are having great impact on people's lives. As symbolized by the SDGs, challenges toward our future cannot be solved without collaboration among people beyond national and linguistic borders. Many of the issues need to be overcome through collaboration beyond borders. Looking at the Japanese society, we are also seeing the waves of internal globalization. This pie chart shows the breakdown of the students requiring Japanese language instruction or assistance. Only 3% are from English speaking countries and 97% are the children from countries where English is not the primary language. Against this backdrop, school education needs to meet people's expectation by fostering students' competencies that cannot be replaced by artificial intelligence. Problem solving, goal finding, understanding and communication information are important skills. Overcoming issues that do not have a simple answer demands cooperation among people with different backgrounds and motives. And that is exactly the scale, skill that is aimed at being fostered under the new course of study. So what is the role being expected of on the part of the foreign language education? Under the new course of study, objectives of all academic subjects have been thoroughly reviewed. One goal was to clarify the capacity and competencies a given subject aims to develop. Another was to redefine the way students learn to develop such competencies. And these two points were critical points with which we reviewed all the academic subjects. The new course of study defined that the objective of foreign language education at primary and secondary education levels is to provide linguistic activities in listening, reading, speaking, and writing in foreign languages to develop competencies to communicate using foreign languages. It also stated that lessons are aimed at teaching grammars and rules to develop skills for reading, speaking, and writing. But it also emphasized that it's equally important to foster cultural sensitivity beyond language so that students can understand and interact with people with different background. Mindful of the circumstantial goals and needs of the person the, per the student is talking to. And these are the new aspects of the new course of study. Under the new course of study, it was defined to start foreign language activities from the third grade. The third grade is also the developmental stage where children are also developing their mother tongue. This leads to Lead, le, this has led to a need to have discussion as to how to coordinate or integrate language studies, both Japanese and non-Japanese languages. Through foreign language activities, children can be exposed to similarities or differences between languages. And also, this can also give an opportunity to be aware of the functions or the roles languages play in communication. These goals can help enrich language learning experiences, both Japanese and non-Japanese. And this also can possibly lead to the first step towards multilingual education in addition to English. Now let's talk about non-English foreign language education. 
as part of Japanese course of study, uh, primary and secondary education, there are several options for students to receive non-English foreign language education. One is to receive such education as an alternative of English as a second, uh, excuse me, second language. Or it can be taught in an integrated school lessons as part of international understanding le lessons in an integrated study programs. Also, it can be provided as part of an extension programs for students and also for non-students. So we can think about a range of format when it comes to foreign language studies, but there are certain expectations people have for school education. By learning extra languages, we can help clarify the goals of language education. When doing so, it is imperative that the issues should not be confined into an either or question. Rather, it should be positioned within, within an overall school education. And learning different languages and needs to be connected to other academic subjects as well. Language education or integrated study, ethics, geography, history, or other social study programs can be coordinated so that students can explore new information and the connections across subject borders. And third, very critical is to pursue such activities beyond school campus, working together with other schools or with other stakeholders, because the opportunities for one to use a given language is rather limited, but working together with other school in abroad, students can have opportunities to use the language for real communication. And students, as well as teachers, can benefit from such a collaboration between different schools and entities. At Ministry of Education, with this understanding, we are promoting several initiatives. One is the JET program that is being promoted with Ministry of Education Ministry of Internal Affairs and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. ALT for non-English language or CIRs or Coordinator for International Relations being invited by this program can be leveraged. As part of the support for foreign language education at school, Promotion of foreign language education commensurate with ongoing globalization is needed. And explore learning goals and teaching and evaluation methods for non-English foreign languages just as important. Also, we are requesting budget needed to support multilingual education within the project for the development of foreign language education experts for the next academic year. And we are hoping that we can receive the budget as requested for the next academic year. In closing, I would like to share with you an anecdote. These are the clues to what I have asked the question at the outset as to the roles of the foreign language education and the existence of artificial education. We have conducted a survey and these are the replies from primary school students. They have learned the convenience 
of such devices and AIs and softwares. At the same time, they are aware that these devices and technologies cannot replace human communication. They found importance in actual communication, face-to-face -face communication with people, which cannot be replaced by technologies. And this, I believe, is the response or the findings on the part of the students that they were able to discover through their experience of learning foreign languages. So, today's symposium is of great importance in that it aims to discuss the topic from different angles beyond specific languages. I would like to express my heartfelt appreciation to all the organizers, including especially Get the Institute Tokyo, DAAD Tokyo, as well as my fellow participants. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ono, for your welcome remarks and also for this uh, very um, interesting information about uh, edu language education here in Japan. So uh, we are now very pleased uh, to welcome the keynote speaker of this event, Professor Yoshimura from the Nara University of Education. And um, he was actually suggested to us as a speaker by our colleagues at the Japan Forum at Chaktful, and we are very grateful to them for nominating such a fascinating speaker. Professor Yoshimura's research interests include, um, among many others, of course, the subject of plurilingualism and language awareness. The title of his keynote speech today is The Outcomes of Plurilingual Practices in Language Education, A Few Cases in Primary and Secondary Schools. We warmly invite you to submit any questions that you have now during his presentation and ask Professor Yoshimura through this Mentimeter link that you can find below, below the live stream on Twitter and Facebook. And now please give a very warm welcome to Professor Yoshimura. I hope you can hear me. Hello to everyone. Is it okay? Yes, we can hear you. Well then, once again, hello, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and I see is Professor Nishiyama, uh, nice to see you. And I am from the Nara University of Education, my name is Yos Masashito Yoshimura, and I have been here at an education university, so I have also been involved in linking together with the education board in regions. And I have been looking at the implementation in schools. And also, we, I have been trying out new ways of teaching together with my grad, stu, uh, grad school students. So today, I will be talking about what I've seen through these implementations. Well, then now I'd like to share the screen with you. So please wait a while. I hope you can see my slides. So now I'd like to start. So this is what I would like to talk about. So I will look at multilingual education in schools that I have been involved in in Japan. A little bit about the background. And then after that, I would like to talk about uh, three examples. One is from a public primary school. A second one is from a secondary education. And the third one is from a public senior high school. And uh, through these examples, I'd like to think about the significance and meaning of multilingual education. Well, then starting with uh, what I have been doing so far, I have been focusing on primary schools and uh, multilingual activities there. So as we've heard from Mr. Ono, um, 
So we have already heard from Mr. Ono, so I'd like to um, just briefly look at this part, but the multilingualism and multiculturalism in uh, primary schools, that is in the background. And you have people from China, uh, South Korea, Vietnam, Philippines, Brazil, Nepal, Taiwan, Indonesia. So culturally and also language-wise, it's quite diverse. And also this is uh, changing the school scenes here in Japan. There are foreign national children who need Japanese language lessons. Um, we had the Lehman Brothers shock and also the Great East Japan earthquake where you see a dip. But in 2018, for example, more than 40,000 people or children uh, needs a Japanese language education. And because of the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, maybe we will see another dip, but over the mid to long term, even in schools, uh, we see more diversity in the language being used as well as a culture. So against this background, um, I have been talking with the school teachers as well as the school boards uh, about how can we can nurture openness to different and multiple languages. So basically, uh, English um, is being used for foreign language activities, but within the classroom or within the school itself or within the community, you have a lot of different languages being used. So first, we want children to realize that and understand that. And so some of the material we used was were taken from Europe, um, language awareness education. Uh, oh, uh, EOLE is one of them, but I won't go into detail here, but um, maybe later on we will hear a little bit more about them. So this is just one example. Uh, all kinds of languages, different languages are being used in the actual education theme. However, uh, is this goal enough? Uh, that was in my mind from the very outset. Is it okay just to have children understand that there's a lot of languages out there? Maybe we have to think about secondary education or lifelong learning. We want to link uh, the primary school education to these, which means that we need to have a more broader awareness among children. So that's what we uh, call metalinguistic awareness or metalinguistic ability. So in the language awareness education, these are very important aspects. So for example, CFR, uh, within the European framework, um, we, you do find some um, descriptions. So these experiences will also help uh, develop the child's own language and the children will be able to look at the commonalities as well as the uniqueness of the language structure. So this is a metalinguistic or interlinguistic awareness. So uh, nurturing an openness to multiple languages and to also have these metalinguistic awareness. How can we have children acquire uh, these attitudes? Let's take a look at three examples. First one is from a pri public a primary school. So one school teacher started to think about this um, and got the colleagues and managerial staff involved and uh, it was done across different subjects. So this was the flow of the activity. Um, I made a report on what was done in the school and actually the paper was written in English. So I just took this chart out of that paper, but on the right hand side, the grayish part um, is the framework of the curriculum. For example, you have social studies, PE, foreign language class, and also the integrated studies period, and also arithmetic at the very bottom. So through these subjects, and you have uh, this crossover between the actual subjects and the activities, and then what is it that children can do within these subjects is written on the left-hand side. For example, in social studies, 
Uh, we can have uh, children think and research about culture, look at what is unique to Japan or unique to Nara, and then share uh, what they found later on. Um, let's say they found out kendama. Um, children they believe that this is a unique toy in Japan. So then let's buy the kendama and use that in PE in order to gain a better balance of the body. Not just play kendama, but think about how you can get better at kendama and try to describe that. Well, PE, of course, is about not just about exercise or sports. Uh, it's about children thinking and also trying to explain how to play sports or how to exercise. So here, uh, children thought about how they can explain, first of all, in Japanese, about how you can become an expert of kendama. And then after that, children started as, tried to explain that in English. So they described that in English, they wrote that down, and then they took that to Nara Park because it is a famous tourist site where many foreign tourists would come. Well, right now, of course, because of the COVID-19, uh, there are almost no tourists. But of course, once COVID-19 is co contained, I believe many foreign tourists will come back. So the children went to Nara Park and they spoke to the foreign tourists using the foreign language classes and the integrated studies period. And they explained about kendama to the foreign tourists and asked them to try uh, play uh, with kendama. However, as they uh, went through this activity, they understood something. Then one thing is that many of the tourists come from non-English speaking countries. Sometimes children spoke English to them. They didn't understand what the children were saying. They asked where they came from and they found out that these tourists come from non-English speaking countries. And the children asked, what language do you speak? And the answer was really various. So children suddenly found what uh, reality uh, was out there. And they brought that information back to school and went on to um, the following classes. For example, in arithmetic, uh, they tried to calculate what percentage of tourists comes from which country, or when children interviewed people, if they spoke to these people and they became interested in these languages, the children tried to create manzai comic skits uh, using these different languages. So the children created the manzai comic skits, uh, and that was done during the integrated studies um, period. I was I wanted to show you a video, but of course, uh, privacy issues have um, uh, made it impossible. Now, in the end, the uh, children tried to talk about their dreams in a foreign language. That was the final goal. Usually this is done in English, but in this school, uh, children decided to pick a language that they liked uh, through speaking to the foreign tourists in Nara Park. First of all, they wrote down what they wanted to say in Japanese, and then they put it through, for example, Google Translate. And then um, the ALT and the school teacher, uh, if it was English, uh, they tried to clear up the language and then uh, the children shared their dreams with others. Now that English and Japanese uh, script was then put through Google Translate once again uh, into the language of choice. And the children found out that the translation from, translation from Japanese to that language or translation from English to that language came out differently. And children started to think about um, what would happen with other languages. They didn't really know, and the teachers as well as the ALTs didn't know if the final translation was correct or not. So the children took the final script in different languages back to Nara Park, tried to find somebody who spoke that language. And it's quite difficult sometimes because let's say the child wanted to speak Turkish or Greeks. 
Maybe these minor, if I can say that, minor languages. Because by coincidence, they met somebody who spoke that language and they chose that and used Google Translate to create a script. They went to Nara Park to find somebody who spoke that language. They had to go again and again to find somebody who spoke the language. And finally, if you find somebody who speaks that language, then the child will read out the script and then ask the tourist to uh, correct their pronunciation or the grammar. And if the tourist had time, um, the children would ask them to teach them to read it correctly. And then the children practice again and again, and in the end, uh, participated in a multilingual speech contest. So it was a two-year activity involving multiple languages. And then at the end, we asked the children what they thought. What do you think about learning languages other than English? So we asked children to write down their comments. And we went through a statistical analysis of text, uh, what kind of language is being used in that. And this is the co-occurrence network. And if I can just uh, show you some of the comments. Uh, by learning languages other than English, it may make us feel go we want to go to these countries. The pronunciation is sometimes different from English. Um, we also find some similarities and differences with English. Sometimes we understand that uh, this language reads like a Roman Romaji in Japanese. So many children uh, wrote comments like this. There were others saying that uh, learning languages other than English uh, is really good. Sometimes you meet somebody speaking Italian and if I can speak in languages other than English, that's really cool. And I sometimes realize that this language and that language is quite different or this and that looks similar. So it is really great to learn languages other than English. And as you can see here, multiple language, to be open to multiple languages and also comparing different languages to understand what is different or what is similar. And that's the experience the children went through. Now, the second example is from um, a junior high school, secondary education. And the teacher in this school, just like the primary school example, um, the teacher wanted to try this out. And so this teacher approached me. And this school didn't teach languages other than English. And this teacher was an English teacher. So within English language education, uh, he, he wanted to bring in multiple languages. And so they, he, he tried out something similar to CLIL. Um, so six uh, hours make up one unit. So in the first hour, as reading material, uh, this was presented, and this uh, provided an opportunity for children to think about language as identity. In the second period, language policy in Europe was the reading material, so CFR uh, looks at plurilingualism, and this is one part of that, and so this was used as a reading material. and children thought about what they thought about this language policy. After that, in the third to fourth hour, uh, let's learn new languages. Uh, so this was a group work and I will come back to this later on. And lastly, in the sixth hour, um, uh, reflection and discussions. Do we need to change language education in Japan? And if we are to change, what should change? Uh, that was discussed. 
Now, in the third to fifth hour of this unit, I would like to explain about what went on with the group work. Um, six groups of, uh, rather, five groups of six people um, were created within the class. It's a class of 30, so, and each person in the group was to select one language out of six. And they were designated as experts of that language. So Chinese, uh, if one child selected Chinese, then other students would have to select another language. So once the language was selected, then some material on that language was distributed. Uh, Nick Webb uh, made this book of languages, and this book looks at multiple languages, and it looks at the history of the language, where the language is being used, and how to count, how to greet people, the, the pronunciation is explained very briefly. So if a child selected Korean, and this is what he or she will be reading. So first of all, he has to read through this and understand this. And then after that, um, the expert group would gather together. So Chinese experts have a meeting and then they worked on the educational material to be on the same page. And they try to be an expert in this language, in teaching this language as well. And then they figure out how the language should be taught to non-experts. For example, they explore fe features of Chinese language and then try to explore what materials would best support the Chinese teaching, for example. And they together create an educational material and then go back to their home group and provide a lesson on the language they are in charge of. And there are several conditions. The language needs to be taught in English, whichever language you the student is in charge of history, geography, and numbers, and greetings. Phrases of greetings needs to be included. And pronunciation was another aspect that needs to be careful about as well. So this activity was for two lesson hours. And after the lesson, they reflect how their viewpoint have been changed and they are asked to write down what they felt and what they have discovered. And the sentences they wrote was quantitatively analyzed, text analyzed, and these are the characteristics of what they wrote. One student said that they only were able to think about Japanese or English when they thought about language. So there, this writer says that his sense of awareness was quite low when it came to languages, but through this lesson, he was able to have a very good opportunity to think about how they should embrace languages. And another female student says that once you're exposed to a new language, you get more curious about the language. And then it was fun to share the new knowledge with the friends. And this girl also said that there were so many languages she didn't know existed. And it, she really wanted to share the learnings with her friends as well. And this student could not attend three lessons. And she wrote like this, I didn't know anything about plurilingualism, and I thought I would be safer if I could speak English. So I was very impressed by this plurilingual perspective. So I really missed the three lessons, and I re regretted that I didn't attend these lessons because students have changed a lot, and I really respected what they did. And I really regretted that I couldn't attend three of the lessons. And I hope that my fellow students or classmates can make best use of their experiences. 
So this, this girl who could not attend the class had a fresh perspective by observing the changes in her friends. So maybe you can have a good idea what kind of renewal process they went through. And in April this year, a new international high school called Prefectural Kokusai High School had some programs. They have a lesson hour of international liberal arts. And where they're coming from is that internationalization is not limited to English learning. So the goal of this subject is to be exposed to different languages, cultures, histories, and natural sciences, thereby gaining knowledge needed for one to become an internationalist. And through explorative, exploratory activities, one aims to develop stronger sense of inquiry and ownership of what they study. So about languages in the world is the subject that is offered from grade one to grade three in this high school. And this is a mandatory subject. All students have to sample all Chinese, Korean, Spanish, French, and German eight hours each during the first year in high school. In the second year, students need to pick one out of the five languages they have learned, and they st keep studying that selected language for the entire year. And in the third year, they will further deepen an understanding of the language they took in the second year. So this is the curriculum of international liberal art subject. So all the students are exposed to the very basics of the five languages. I think that this is a very rare and unique curriculum in Japan. In addition to that, in this world language one, in the first grade of the high school, they also have a linguistic awareness activity before being exposed to these activities. So just increasing the number of languages they learn does not suffice. They have to make comparative analysis between languages, or they may want to explore similarities and differences between different languages. And that kind of opportunity should be given to students. And this is also included in CEFL. It is imperative to interconnect different languages because linguistic transfer is possible and that possibility needs to be felt direct hand by students to make best of the opportunities. And I usually give a lesson as a guest lecturer every year and I'm going to do that again this year in this is something that I am capitalizing on in trying to develop any metalinguistic ability in students. I'm going to show you some examples about this in language awareness activity. For example, I usual, I typically start the lesson with a language related quizzes by asking them the difference between language and a dialect and the number of languages spoken in Japan and number of languages spoken in Japan. I'm gonna show you some slides. How many languages are spoken in Japan? I'll give you 10 seconds. And maybe students can talk to their neighbors in their seat. But anyway, I give them like 10 seconds to somehow come up with what they thought was the answer. And these are the languages I knew, Japanese, Japanese sign language, Korean, or some dialogue, dialects all the way down. Say, for example, ethnologue. 
now a fee for service web page, but you can know the number of the languages spoken in Japan. And I can give them the clue. And I can also give you general information about languages or the number of official language in the United States. And what are these languages or what are the num what is the number of official language in EU or what is the official languages of New Zealand? These are the questions that I would typically start my lesson with. And also, I would prod the student encourage the students to think about language proficiency. Is it like a addition of monolinguistic abilities or is it more like a plurilinguistic abilities that is integrated all together? That kind of question is also posed to high school students. And I would also include the concept of common underlying proficiency. Say, for example, by asking them what really is a language command of language or language proficiency. And for example, a Japanese proficiency. And the second language being, for example, English. And this is something that is perceived by some people. This may be true, but there is another perspective to look at language proficiency. For example, some researchers have an idea of common underlying proficiency across different languages. Cummings, for example, has argued that different languages share common underlying proficiency. And I share this, this model with the students and then the students would, some of the students may react, oh, that can't be true because English being so different from Japanese. And then I show them some quiz. These are the names of months written down in phonetical Japanese letters. So from January to April in four languages are written on this slide. And this is an expert excerpts from the awakening of languages. And this is another quiz that I would give. It's written in phon phonetic Japanese letters, katakana as we call it. So it may be difficult for non-Japanese speakers. But students, high school students can typically group similar looking words. And one may suggest that these four can be from the same language because they are similar sound ending with ue. And then another would suggest these blue ones can be from the same language because it all ends with the sound wall. And then this these red cars may be from the same language because it all starts with the sound tan. And then students almost always successfully group languages. And then, then I would ask them why. And then the students would reply that these same colored cars share the similar sound. And they suggest that it, yue possibly means month because Japanese says ichi gatsu, ni gatsu, gatsu meaning month. So in Japanese, it is a combination of the number and month. Also, wall is probably month. And before wall is the sound of the number, perhaps, they argue. So they don't know which languages these are. And then I asked them why they were able to figure out which cars come from the same languages and they were using their intuitive knowledge that already exists in students, I tell them. So that is sort of a transferable knowledge, interlingually transferable knowledge. So what then are the significance of multilingual education through exposures of multilingual 
knowledge from primary school, one can foster openness about languages and language diversity. And this can possibly help develop metalinguistic capacity in students at secondary education level. And with some language awareness education, language proficiency or social sociolinguistic ability can be enhanced. At the same time, enhancing the interest in linguistic studies. And these are the questions that I'm going to explore. Well, the school started this academic subject just this April, so I have to spend some more years. Mandatory education, multilingual education, can, I hope, possibly enhance English study. If that can be proved, this kind of linguistic education program can be adopted by a wider range of schools as well, possibly leading to a discussion whether they should overhaul English. And this is something that I will be presenting at the German educa language education section of Japan German Association sometime next year. And I would now like to conclude my presentation and I look forward to having active dis discussion. Okay, hey, many thanks to Professor Yoshimura for these insights into plurilingual practices in language education. This was very interesting and I can see that we have received several questions from our audience and I would like to start right with the first question. So um, someone asked or someone first of all commented that learning foreign languages uh, actually means also learning to understand the emotions or the thoughts of foreign persons. And I think this goes into the direction of intercultural learning. And um, that person would like to know um, if you think, uh, or what is your idea, how can we uh, bring this awareness also to um, persons who, like, like children, who have not uh, uh, learned uh, foreign languages that much yet, but um, who rather, yeah, they are just like mother tongue speakers and they, uh, they, uh, don't know about intercultural aspects uh, that much yet, much yet. So how can we bring this awareness to children and to other persons who are not that familiar with uh, learning uh, foreign languages yet? Well, I believe uh, Mr. Ono talked about this a little bit, but right now already online, we can connect with many people um, around the world. So if we have the infrastructure and if the teachers are willing, um, let's say even if you are in the kindergarten or even younger, you will be able to start up a project together with the child. And even if you are not in a foreign language environment, uh, you can utilize this infrastructure to link with other cultures and other languages and then you will be able to bring about the awareness okay thank you very much for that answer another person probably um from uh, probably uh, listening to us this uh, morning in, in europe um uh, is uh, asking so in europe uh, multilingualism is uh, highly promoted um, by the EU, and uh, that person wonders whether learning, especially the naval languages, um, is also something that uh, is promoted in Japan. So naval language is probably the term of uh, Asian, other in Asian uh, languages. Do you know anything about that, Professor Yoshimura? Hi. This uh, is you may or may not be aware of the situation. Our neighboring language is Korean and Chinese. And I linguists consider that these languages should be taught to children. But there are political factors between Japan and these countries. And there are some issues, especially in recent years. 
and some people tend to shun away from those languages. But from a linguistic point of view, it is very important to promote language studies, especially at this time of difficult issues. About Korean, it was once a very popular language for Japanese to study, but the popularity declined. And for economic reasons, some people, there were increasing people studying Chinese at one point, but English is the most popular for Japanese students. And that needs to be changed somehow. Hey, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we have time for one last question. Um, so uh, there's another question um, who states uh, that there were a lot of interesting information now about um, learning foreign languages um, at schools. And uh, that person uh, wonders, what about the situation at the universities? Is it already too late to get a multilingual education at the university level? Or even um, if you consider person, uh, persons that are outside of the education system, so, um, like adults um, that are already working or something, um, is there still a way or do you have an idea or an approach that you could offer to uh, educate them in a multilingual way? Hi, hi. Uh, ah, sorry, uh, this was uh, to Mr. Yoshimura actually uh, as well. Sorry. Well, probably other professors will be able to provide a, a better answer um, about education, foreign language education in university. Okay, then I think we should uh, leave this question then maybe to, uh, to Mr. Nishiyama at a later point then. Okay, then considering the time, I would like to thank you again very much, Professor Yoshimura, for uh, your presentation and also for those further insights now during the Q&A session. And um, yeah, I hand over to Matthias then. Yes, so now um, we will be turning to the next chapter of this uh, symposium, which is uh, five January sessions uh, around uh, topics we have selected to further explore in, uh, in, in detail regarding the relatively broad subject uh, of um, multilingualism, plurilingualism. And we have selected um, uh, the uh, personal development uh, classroom, uh, curriculum planning, research and society, um, and uh, I think we have five topics which are also fairly uh, broad in itself, but um, that can uh, reveal quite interesting uh, insights uh, to us. So, um, please, at this point, let me uh, give a warm welcome to our plenary speakers uh, that have arrived on the, on the stage. That is uh, Professor uh, uh, John Maher. Hello and uh, welcome. Uh, Professor uh, Wei Youyuan, very welcome. Uh, Professor Yang Guangjun, welcome also to, uh, to this plenary uh, session. Uh, Professor Noriyuki Nishiyama, welcome. Uh, Professor Nicole Marx, Welcome, and uh, Professor Hyun Hee Chong, also very welcome. The experts will give each a five minute summary uh, of their plenary speeches, which were available online in full to those who registered for this uh, event. But in case you were not able to register in advance, don't worry, we will make all these uh, speeches uh, in full length uh, available also after the uh, symposium. And um, after each five minute summary, uh, you will be given the opportunity to ask questions. Of course, you can submit these questions uh, already to us um, during uh, those uh, summaries when they come to your mind. Um, and um, we will uh, do our best to, um, to give, uh, transfer them all to the, uh, to the speaker. The first one uh, to, to speak to us today is uh, Professor Maher. 
Uh, his contribution today was facilitated by our Spanish colleagues uh, from the Instituto uh, Cervantes. Professor Maher is Professor of Linguistics at the Department of Society, Culture and Media, uh, International Christian uh, University, uh, Tokyo, where he teaches sociolinguistics. He was lecturer in Japanese at the University of Edinburgh and senior academic member at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. He has written over 100 articles and 10 books uh, on the subject of multilingualism and language. And today he's going to summarize for us uh, his presentation, which has the title Language and Persons, Multilingualism and Personal Development. So that is the focus of our uh, of our first uh, speech. So welcome to submit any questions through Mentimeter, that, which is um, uh, visible on the uh, social media. You just have to click the link and you can submit uh, questions to us. Yeah, with that, I hand over to Professor Maher. Thank you very much. And I give you then the stage. Buenos tardes, good evening. It is a pleasure to speak to you today. Can you hear me? Yes. In my lecture, I made one point, and I will add another point uh, today, this evening. The purpose of linguistic awareness, as I have described, is to raise awareness of language in society. The core of multilingualism is to understand the role of language in society, in our lives as persons. We do not study language in school. Children study how to, uh, people, children study biology in order to study the human body, animals and plants. Children study history and social science in order to study uh, understand culture. However, children do not have the opportunity in our schools to study the basic questions of language. And this is the core of metalinguistic awareness, or what was known as ling language awareness. I was a teacher in London in the 1970s and was part of the language awareness uh, movement. The language awareness movement in London, from the, in England and Scotland in the 1970s and 80s, was started because of discrimination. Discrimination between speakers of Queen's English and dialect. Prejudice, discrimination, was one of the topics of school education at that time. And language teachers realized that perhaps language and understanding language is a key to overcoming such discriminatory ideas. Another topic was bullying. There was a bullying problem when I was a school teacher. And in those days, we realized as language teachers that perhaps language is also a key to understanding how to use language effectively, how we are cruel with language, how we damage people with language, and how language must be respected, and perhaps language can create peace between people. So the core of language awareness was not multilingualism at all. It was to solve and address social problems and to raise children's awareness of those things. Other questions uh, dealt with in language awareness uh, are, are these. Now, we study sex education, but we do not study language education. We study maths education, but we do not study language education. So some of the questions we ask in language awareness 
are how do babies learn language? What is a minority language? If I become a parent, a mother or a father, how do I help children with language? And suppose my child does not speak, what then? And so this was the core of language awareness and this is what we should do to insert language awareness in, in schools. And this is the job, not only of foreign language teachers, but also of mother tongue teachers. And this combination is also the key of language awareness, bridging those two, mother tongue teachers and foreign uh, language teachers as well. And so that is the answer to Mr. Ono's question. Mr. Ono asked, how can we connect mother tongue education and foreign language education? The answer is that you put the two language teachers together and they both create a curriculum where language is the core. Now, let me expand on this in a somewhat theoretical way. And that is the difference between mother tongue and foreign language. The border between foreign language and mother tongue is an artificial border. Teachers and children make too strong a difference between the mother tongue and foreign language. We hear inaccurate statements like Japanese is completely different from uh, foreign languages. And Professor Yoshimura gave very good examples to show that this is probably not true. We think of the mother tongue as natural, as inside. We think of the second language or a foreign language as alien, outside. This is a mistake. The foreign language, the, the mother tongue is also a foreign language. Why? Because the mother tongue is a borrowed language. The mother tongue is taken from our environment. The mother tongue was borrow is borrowed from history, past history from people that we have never met. The mother tongue is borrowed from our environment. So the mother tongue is just as exotic, is just as foreign as a foreign language. The mother tongue is not natural at all. The Swiss linguist Saussure said, if it is a mass of heterogeneous facts given to us in childhood. And the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said, a child approaches the mother tongue as a stranger at the gates of a foreign city. Well, this is a philosophical point. And the point I'm making is that we need to relook and rethink the artificial boundary between the mother tongue and foreign language. That is also our duty in language awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Maher. And uh, I think we have a very interesting first question, which is, uh, I think, exactly touching on what you just um, uh, said um, in your summary. It is um, about the Sapir-Whorf uh, hypothesis, uh, which establishes a connection between uh, the mother tongue that somebody speaks and uh, the a cultural thinking of uh, of that person, how it is connected and how the um, cultural image that someone has is actually shaped by the uh, by the mother tongue uh, that uh, we um, learn. And um, the question here is um, if there's any research or what would be your opinion um, how is that cultural image shaped in case we will um, we we grow up uh, bilingual or even trilingual? Uh, how does that influence our um, cultural perception? Shall I answer now? Yes, please. Language is a mosaic. Language is a mass of facts. The mother tongue is not one thing. 
And the Japanese language is a hundred things. The Japanese language is full of different cultures, hundreds of cultures in region, in age, in thinking, in dialects, in social lects, in gender lects. Japanese language is a hundred cultures and the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis uh, does not take account of the multilingualism within a single language. Each language is multilingual. Each language has hundreds of cultures inside it. The Sapir-Whorf idea was simply based on the boundaries between language, languages. And those boundaries we now see, the boundaries between languages and cultures are false. They are a mistake. They are theoretically uh, indefensible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question, I think, is also very well connected uh, to this one. So as understood from your speech, one could say that Japan is already a society where we have multiple languages coexisting in, uh, in daily life. You gave uh, a lot of examples also in your, uh, in your full speech. And now the question is, uh, what in your view needs to be done to make this Uh, coexistence in society that we already have um, more recognized uh, by um, by society. Who is the who is the one who should actually um, do something about it? Is it only a task for for official institutions? You mentioned the household survey in your um, in your full speech, or is it not rather? Um, the teachers, the parents, um, everyone around in daily life who actually should give tribute to this coexistence of multiple languages. A dynamic new curriculum that combines the power of mother tongue teaching, kokugo kyoiku, and foreign language teaching, and which combines teachers who have a new vision of a shared language, that the idea of the mother tongue, that Japanese here in Japan, Japanese and other languages are united as language, uh, as language that we share. That is one concept that we can introduce uh, to schools. And it's not an alien concept. It's not an exotic concept, but it's something Uh, school teachers usually welcome. Uh, language awareness in Canada and, and Britain and many other places have been doing this by combining mother tongue teaching and foreign language teaching. It's worked elsewhere. It can work in Japan. Thank you very much. I think that also pretty much answers another question that we have um, because you gave the example of a person uh, speaking uh, Ainugo. Uh, in in Hokkaido and how this um, how this um, language awareness about these um, different languages could be um, could be made possible at schools. I think that's just what you uh, you answered right yes. now. So thank you. Yeah, many thanks um, again, Professor Maher. Um, and uh, we now move on to the next topic uh, in connection um, with multilingualism, which is again of, um, we think, um, very much practical importance. Uh, it is the practical implementation and the challenges of multilingualism in the classroom. Uh, and we are very happy um, that Professor Wei Youyuan, uh, together with uh, Professor Yang Guangjin, Uh, is, um, is here with us um, to address this topic. Professor Wei's participation was made uh, possible by our Chinese colleagues. He is a professor in the Department of Japanese uh, Studies at uh, Tongji University in Shanghai. He specializes in Japanese modern literature and has many years of experience also in Japanese language education. Uh, Mr. Yang Guangjun uh, is president of the Confucius Institute at JF Oberlin University, uh, the professor of global communication and assistant to the president of Oberlin University. He has developed a new method for Chinese language tra uh, training. 
Please feel also free um, during the speech to submit uh, questions on uh, Mentimeter uh, to this topic, um, multilingualism and um, classroom. And um, now I hand over to Professor Wei and Professor Young, uh, and they have some summarized the speech, uh, Chinese language education in a non-Chinese language environment. So please um, um, let us hear your summary. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Wei from Tonji University. I'd like to share my screen, so please wait a while. I do hope uh, you can hear me well. Um, it seems I cannot share my slides, but uh, let me speak. So I talked about Jack Chinese language education in a in a non-Chinese language environment. And um, this was taken from the example of Orbelin University. So we have an education where we teach uh, learners whose mother tongue is not Chinese. So what we do is, uh, first of all, the condition is that there is no Chinese language environment outside of the classroom. And so we artificially create a language environment inside the classroom. And of course, this is university uh, course, so there is a limit to the number of class hours. And the target students would be mostly Japanese students. And there are a few uh, other foreign students. And the age of the students, of course, will be past the critical period of language education. Most of the students are past that critical period. The critical period, uh, there are two stages to this. The first one is from zero to five years old. That's the first period. And then after that, it's said that the second period is from 11 to 12 or so, according to theory. So, and we try to create a, an education model. So we teach Chinese in, the chi in Chinese. So all conversations in class is carried out in Chinese. And we are maximizing the number of class hours that we can use. We have a very intensive course. Uh, but of course, these hours will not be enough. So outside of the classroom, we also provide some tasks for uh, the students to complete. So we have introduced a task-based teaching method. And also we have these Chinese language salons, um, maybe once every two weeks or so, the students, um, Japanese students together with uh, Chinese international students uh, will open these salons and they will talk to each other in Chinese. And we also have some speech contests and also some karaoke contests uh, singing Chinese songs. And in the classes, the four skills of language will be integrated together. And we have a very short-term intensive course at Orbelin University. Uh, the faculty form a relay. So the same class is being taught by, for example, four teachers. And in one term, there are four achievement tests to look at the progress of the student. And it, it would look at the four skills of reading, writing, hearing, and speaking. 
And all these four skills uh, will be taught in one class. Uh, usually, these four are divided into four different subjects, but at o Oberlin University, they are put into one subject. And the reason why we do this is because we believe that the stimulus frequency using this um, foreign language should be maximized. So even students who started from zero knowledge of Chinese, because they have a lot of stimulus, they will be able to acquire that language. Uh, it may be difficult at the outset, but um, even the silent period, the so-called silent period is very effective. Even during the silent period, uh, we believe that learning is effective. And depending on the student, it may differ how long this silent period lasts. But in any case, uh, it is still very effective for the learning. And also, language is acquired through language activities. That's our belief, um, carrying out all kinds of cultural activities, uh, learn learning about the Chinese culture, um, and taking part in cultural events. Um, through these activities, uh, the students will be able to acquire uh, the language. And thirdly, in the third and fourth year of university, I believe many universities would provide some selective courses. But we have concentrated all that class in the first and second year. And we believe that that, uh, that is more effective um, for language acquisition. So students who started in the first year, even if they started from zero Chinese knowledge in just eight months, uh, they are able to pass level four of the HSK Chinese proficiency test. test. Level four means uh, in many J Japanese universities, um, you might take a Chinese course in four years, but at Oberlin University, you can acquire that four year worth of Chinese lessons in just eight months. And also, after the, the second year, many students would go to Tonji University. And but uh, even before uh, studying abroad, they are gaining a Chinese proficiency. And in Japan, every year, uh, there is a Chinese speech contest. And for Oberlin University, uh, almost every year, the students get first place. So I believe uh, our way of teaching is showing effect. So the implementation that we have, um, even in a, in a non-Chinese language environment, uh, we, I believe that we are getting good results. So um, that was a um, very brief, but I'd like to end my uh, summary report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wei. And um, again, we have um, a lot of very interesting uh, questions. Uh, the first one, um, uh, is about, um, you mentioned that um, at uh, Oberlin University, um, you have um, uh, native uh, speakers who are teaching the, the Chinese classes. So it's possible um, to hold the classes um, uh, uh, in Chinese. And um, the question is about um, how it is uh, in the beginner's classes when the students just start with uh, Chinese language. Is it also uh, possible um, to use only Chinese or would you involve a certain amount of uh, Japanese language or maybe other languages also um, English considered um, to help, for example, when there are explanations about grammar or something like this? Uh, yes, I am Yang from Oberlin Uni University. Um, Professor Wei and myself uh, together uh, compiled this report, but um, why is it that uh, we have um, had this joint project together with Professor Wei at Dosa University? 
uh, the, the Confucius Institute is established in 15 universities in Japan. And each Confucius Institute is uh, managed between a Chinese university and Japanese university. In our case, um, that university in China is the Donji University in Shanghai. So uh, to answer the question, for a learner uh, who has zero knowledge, why do we use Chinese uh, to teach Chinese language and what is the effect of that? I believe uh, Professor Yoshimura uh, talked about a meta-language and the importance of meta-language. Uh, so when you teach a second language or a foreign language, uh, there are two, there have been two perspectives. Uh, one is uh, the translation method, uh, which is an indirect method of teaching. So you have used a certain language to teach the learned language. Uh, you explain about that language in a different language. But the contents have changed, uh, the way of teaching has changed, and now we are using the word middle language. The second way of teaching is direct teaching, which means you teach a certain language using that language. These two pedagogies, uh, which is better? Oh, as Mr. Ono said, uh, there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, and uh, it may depend on the situation. In the case of Oberlin University, we are using the direct method. So it's an immersive type of education. So you only use Chinese. So when you are a freshman and you have to start from zero. So what do we do? Um, even if the person is uh, learning Chinese for the first time, we speak to them in Chinese. And there are many thinkings behind this. Uh, language acquisition is a very personal thing. Uh, you don't have to go to school, but we are providing that lesson at school. So we tried to come up with the most effective method. And that method may change from university to university. That's why you have these different universities. Each university has their own research behind this and they take uh, the method that they believe is best. In our case, we use Chinese to teach Chinese. And our target students are university students. They are strong enough uh, mentally uh, to survive even very tough situations. And so the method, the teaching method may differ depending on the student's age, but we believe for university students, it's okay to be very tough on them. And Professor Wei uh, explained this a bit, but at the very beginning, um, Yes, the teacher will speak Chinese, uh, the students will not understand a word. But when they don't understand, what is happening inside their mind? It doesn't mean that their brains are not working. Their brains are working, um, even if it, it is a silent phase. So even during the silent period, speaking to them in Chinese is effective. So a second language education should 
uh, be like uh, acquiring the first language, the mother tongue. Even in the mother tongue, uh, you, there is a silent period. So you have to use that language to learn that language in order to interpret that language. You don't need to have another language. It's not as if you have to translate everything in order to understand and interpret a language. You look at a person's body language, how they move. Maybe the teacher sometimes will dance or cry, but all that is information. So you can interpret a language using non-linguistic information. And you can formalize things that are put into words. Uh, and if you put it in a form, it may be easier to understand. Uh, you can try to explain what a word means using other methods. And it's not 100% direct method. We provide a dictionary or we allow students to use dictionary so that they can understand Chinese through Japanese language. So the students, when they don't understand something, they would look into a dictionary. And even if, if they don't understand what the teacher is saying, uh, even if you look at that student, uh, that teacher, uh, they will use a dictionary to understand that. Uh, if they leave things without understanding, that uh, is not going to be good because it. in the past, I believe uh, university education was full of services. Students did not learn by themselves. They did not look up the dictionary. They did not try to find ways to understand because this teacher would explain it to them. So we are giving them a situation where it's necessary for them to do their own research and do their own study. So inside a classroom, everything is being done in Chinese. Why do we have to do this? Because once you step outside of the classroom, there is no Chinese, Chinese speaking environment. Very important in language education is the frequency of stimulus using a language, using Chinese for stimulus. We want to maximize that. So the students, uh, they are trying to comprehend what is happening in front of them. As Professor Wei said, yes, the students are past their critical period of language acquisition. Inside a piece, person's mind, there is this machine that um, acquires and learns language. And as you grow older, uh, the working of that machine becomes less and less. And, and that is will be compensated by more comprehension. So there are things that is explained and understood. And there are things that is newly structured inside one's brain. And people have both. Uh, functions. So even during the silent period, people are trying to understand what is happening. They are trying to construct a new structure inside their brains. And over the, a decade or so, we were able to teach in this way. Once people start speaking Chinese, what they have been piling up during the silent period would suddenly explode and flow out. And we have been doing this over a decade. And um, for a freshman, if we start uh, classes just in Chinese, there were no problems. 
I'm very sorry. I have spoken too long. Oh, uh, thank you very much for these insights um, into the, the teaching method of, uh, of, of Chinese language. I think that for all of us um, uh, was a um, very good experience to, to get to know. And you had many practical examples also um, on how to uh, actually teach the language. Um, I would also um, uh, once again um, encourage everyone to watch the full um, a video um, of uh, Professor Wei's uh, presentation, which will be available online also after the symposium, um, which of course goes into a little more detail than what we could cover here. Uh, thank you. So um, we are um, moving to the uh, third topic, um, which concerns multilingualism and curriculum uh, planning. And it is uh, being presented to us by Professor Nishiyama Noriyuki, who was introduced uh, to us by the uh, Institut Francais du Japon and the French Embassy. Mr. Nishiyama is a professor at the Graduate School of Human and Environmental Studies, Faculty of Integrated Human Studies at the Kyoto University. He has done very extensive research on the teaching of foreign languages in Japan. The title of the presentation, which he will now uh, summarize uh, to us, is Multilingualism and Curricula, Reflection from the Point of View of Plurilingualism. Professor Nishiyama, thanks very much. And um, again, um, we uh, already got many uh, interesting questions uh, through Mentimeter. And um, I like to mention that once again, also during this speech, please feel free to ask questions. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Hello, I am Noriyuki Nishiyama. I am in charge of foreign language education and language policy studies at Kyoto University. I have discussed in a longer version of my discussion about plurilingualism in detail, but I would attempt to summarize my presentation. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is it okay? Is everyone listening to my voice? Yes, it is. Um, everything is fine. Thank you. Now, the theme is plurilingualism. And Professor Yoshimura has made a very good recap, so he did leave me many stones unturned. But about the multilingual education and non-English foreign language education is something that I would like to talk about. How can we create an educational environment where students can learn different languages other than English? Does it suffice to add several foreign languages to the curriculum to realize multilingual education? While it is necessary to include more than one foreign languages to the school curriculum, doing so would not necessarily achieve multilingual educational landscape. That's my assertion. As has been pointed out by Professor Yoshimura, CEFR, Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, is something that I would like to make a reference to. CEFR has taken plurilingualism as a new approach to foreign language education. People's command of multiple languages is possible. But that is not a separate 
capacity. The CFR asserts that plurilingual competence is not an additional monolingual competency, but a complex or even composite competence across different languages. In other words, when an individual has communicative competence in a number of languages, that person is not commanding a distinct competence compartmentalized in a given language. It's not compartmentalized by languages. Rather, multiple number of languages are cross-referenced, and that is a key to foreign language study. Say, for example, when you study French, it is useful to refer to your knowledge in Japanese language learning or English language learning so that you can discover interlinkages among different languages. That is why it is important to cross-reference other languages in teaching and learning a language. Conventionally, however, foreign language education has avoided referencing to elements in other foreign languages, maintaining a clear division between languages. When one is studying English, one should focus on English language and English language only. And the same is true for learning French. However, plurilingual education, as asserted by CFR, strongly argues the need for interchanges among different languages, including one's mother tongue, because Doing so contributes to higher efficiency in learning distinct languages. To this end, well, plurilingual education does not deny distinct language study. Rather, it only proposes cross-referencing among different languages for higher efficiency in learning languages. And to this end, it proposes four pedagogies that are, as has been introduced, awakening to languages. And second one is intercomprehension between related languages. For example, in case of European languages in the family of German language, English and German are relatively similar and they can be learned efficiently or in Asia, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean have some commonalities and these three languages can be learned together or cross-referenced when one is learning one of the three. Or some of the elements in those approaches can be achieved in a foreign language lesson or intercultural education encourages students to compare cultures of one's own and the cultures of the target language, or to look at own lang cultural language from the culture of the target language. These pedagogies can be utilized in distinct language lessons. Say, for example, in French language classes, these elements can be partially imported or it can be pursued in a cross-curricular manner at school. Say, for example, secondary school initiatives introduced by the previous speaker are wonderful examples as how these lessons can be pursued in a cross-curricular manner. New educational materials and methods are being developed for these approaches. Professor Yoshimura also pointed out some cases at the 
primary education. And those foreign language activity of primary education in Japan does not necessarily have to be English, as pointed out by Professor Yoshimura. It, this means it's okay to deal with several languages concurrently, but for some reason, it is almost always English. However, legally speaking, several different languages can be pursued concurrently. And by introducing elements of awakening to languages to these lessons, in these foreign language activities, barriers to different languages may possibly be lowered. Early education of foreign languages or early exposure to foreign culture at primary school is because children are less prone to biases or prejudices. As people get older, they tend to be less open to something different than their own, whereas children are more open to different languages, different cultures, or anything different for that matter. Professor Yoshimura also touched upon a question about language study. This should not be limited to children. Language can be learned by adults, as has been touched by Oberlin University professor as well. So adults can learn new languages. I started learning French after I entered college, but I was able to learn the language. So at a hypothesis that it's only children who are good at learning new languages is a sort of bias, if I may. Children may be a better learner when it comes to pronunciation, which is true. And also the critical phase that has been touched upon repeatedly. But that is about mother tongue. But when it comes to foreign language learning, age doesn't really matter. And regardless of one's age, Anyone can enjoy learning a foreign language, and some people have even become an interpreter, having started a la language after a critical age. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have actually two questions that um, I think are somehow connected, so I'll try to um, put them into one question because they are both concerning the university education. And I think at least in part, you already provided the answer to that question. So the question is um, that the viewer um, uh, believes that um, many students in Japan still have to learn a second obligatory language in the university, but which they are often not too much motivated to learn because of the language um, itself, but more because of the credits um, they uh, they are getting from um, from having that subject in their cu curriculum and um, could um, a pl plurilingual approach um, maybe help to improve this situation to um, uh, to make um, students more motivated to um, learn a second language in university and the other question is is that even possible at university level or is it already too late. Thank you very much. Plurilingual approach, is it useful for mandatory second foreign language courses? Is it useful? I truly hope that it does. But the second foreign language at university level is different from English in the sense that the lesson hours are very limited, only two hours a week. 
So it, the students can spend only 90 hours a year. And it may be difficult to achieve the same level of proficiency as they would in English due to the fewer lesson hours. So how should we deal with the situation? So may it may not be practical to set the goal as achieving a similar proficiency of a second foreign language as English. Rather, second foreign language study can be quite useful after graduation, or it can provide you a basis after graduation. So induction to a secondary foreign language at university level can help one's professional career as the needs arise. So usefulness cannot be July evaluated at the time of university years. However, after graduation, it can be useful, plus it can provide a new perspective that may otherwise not be able to be achieved through English language study. So this second foreign language is something that may be more elusive in terms of the target, but University is the period when one can be exposed to non-English language or non-English speaking culture. So that can be an added bonus as well. Thank you very much um, for these insights. And now we, um, we have arrived at our fourth topic, which tackles the current state of research on the topic of uh, multilingualism. Our guest is Professor Nicole Marx. Uh, she's well known to us since she has already visited, visited us live in uh, Tokyo. Unfortunately, it's not possible uh, in uh, this year. She is a professor of German as a second language at the University of Cologne and a chair of the Department of Language and Learning at the Mercator Institute. Her research focuses on second uh, foreign and tertiary language learning, multilingual teaching and learning approaches, writing and quantitative uh, empirical methods in language teaching and in learning research. The title of the presentation um, that is being summarized now is Progressing, Spiraling or Recycling on the Development of Plurilingualism Research and its Impact Today. Very welcome and I hand over the virtual microphone. Well, thank you very much for this lovely introduction and the opportunity to uh, hear uh, more about plurilingualism and multilingualism in Japan. Um, you may have noticed that I didn't summarize plurilingualism research in my paper. And um, that, was, that was more of a tactical decision. Uh, one of the reasons is because if you uh, are offering a condensed version of a, of a topic um, online, uh, it's uh, difficult to go into the, uh, to the full breadth and of, of an area. And, um, and also because it's very difficult to summarize the field of plurilingualism research without being reduced to complete banalities. <laughs> um, so what I did was I focused on a consideration of um, second language acquisition research and uh, what's been enhanced by plurilingualism. Now, plurilingualism research has uh, had a few very slow beginnings, uh, but very important ones, uh, even in the 1800s and more recently in the 1960s and 1970s. And it has uh, not just expanded, but of course, uh, due to more interest uh, being given to the field, it has changed a lot over the last years, especially since the end of the 1990s and the beginning of stronger research on topics of trilingualism, plurilingualism, multiple language learning and plurilingual learners. Um, the interesting thing about that is that research foci is very often still uh, based on uh, issues of second language acquisition research that we've been looking at for at least 50 years. 
Um, it just has a bit of a new twist, and this twist involves examining plurilingual competencies or special characteristics of plurilingual learners. Um, and in addition to these, to these um, more traditional foci, we've uh, been able to open up a whole new field with uh, new research objects and foci, um, such as the dynamics of individual multilingual um, or multilingual uh, language use and learning, um, and especially uh, a very strong focus on how languages interact, how they support each other, and maybe how they disturb each other within an individual. And this has had a very big um, uh, impact on how we view various constructs which have been for a very long time very central to our understanding of uh, language learning, second and foreign language learning. Uh, one case in point, which I talked about in my uh, speech, would be understanding transfer as the movement of knowledge from one language that an individual has acquired or learned into another language, uh, using knowledge uh, that has already been acquired to uh, acquire a new language or having this knowledge uh, cause troubles in the new language. Now, a consideration of plurilingualism allows us to reconsider this construct and also its utility in the broader context of language development. So plurilingual research has enabled us to open up uh, new questions to old constructs. Um, and that's, that has a very positive effect of, on our understanding of language learning and multiple language learning. And at the same time, I often feel that considerations of plurilingualism, um, which include taking um, a broader perspective on language development, a multilinguist perspective, are becoming less visible in the past years. And that leads to what I would see as more of a traditional monolinguist perspective within research that we're in a way regressing back to focusing on only one language or at the most, on the interaction of first language and, and uh, target language or language being uh, focused. So that once again, the learner is seen as a bit of a blank slate instead of someone who potentially already has developed a very large amount of linguistic uh, knowledge, communicative knowledge and cultural knowledge. Um, and that means on the one hand, we seem to be sort of stuck in a very traditional blank slate view of language learning. Um, and on the other hand, um, that we are judging plurilingual speakers uh, as if they were merely monolinguals and uh, then at the best as, as monolinguals with problems because uh, they're learning a new language. So um, I think this is a bit of a, a problem that we're facing right now in the field of plurilingualism research. And we really need to go back to the beginnings of plurilingual re lism research and maybe to the, to the main push in the late 1990s, early 2000s and um, and think about research on language as something that needs to be informed by a more broader plurilingual perspective, even if we're only researching development in one language, um, and uh, reflect on and, and not forget that we are almost always when we're researching uh, plurilingual, when we're researching learners, we're researching plurilingual learners. We're researching learners who have a very broad knowledge of, um, or broad um, view or um, um, amount of linguistic competence, amount of linguistic knowledge, and, uh, and be aware of that and consider that uh, within research as well. So. Thank you very much. Um, and here from one uh, viewer, there is, um, I think, a very uh, interesting question that is about how to actually measure this uh, competency. So it, um, the, the viewer says it's, um, it's uh, fairly well known or there are a lot of tools how you can measure one person's competence in uh, speaking one language. Um, but are there any tools or how would you exactly measure a plurilingual uh, competency? Is there a tool or something or is this um, a field maybe still in the open and uh, this needs to be developed? Uh, that's an excellent question and one of the reasons why plurilingualism research is actually a lot of fun um, uh, in addition to being very important at least in my opinion um, it really depends on your perspective and it's the same thing for for foreign language uh, acquisition research or second language acquisition research or l2 research um, if you're looking at trying to determine language competency in one language um, 
there are a lot of uh, considerations that you bring in when um, when you're trying to research the language. Um, and we tend to focus on certain aspects, for example, morphological uh, competencies. And uh, one of the roots has been traditionally to look at specific aspects of language learning or language in multiple languages and then compare them um, either within the languages, within the individuals, uh, compare their development over time or compare um, their, their development in comparison to people who don't speak the other languages. Uh, for example, in Germany, we had a very uh, big push at the end of the 90s, beginning 2000s, where we compared learners who had already learned English as a foreign language, who were from other countries maybe, with and were learning German. Uh, and we compared them to learners who hadn't learned English um, because, for example, as here, as uh, Mr. Nishiyama said, English and German are very closely related languages. Maybe uh, learners can capitalize on that. So that's one direction that research has gone. Another direction that research goes is, uh, is on metalinguistic linguistic awareness, uh, whether implicit or explicit. Um, and I think um, uh, Mr. Mayer, uh, Maher um, said, uh, talked, uh, talked quite a bit about this, um, and the considerations are, are also the same for plurilingualism research. And there's various ways of going about that. One of the first ways was uh, asking plurilingual learners, as opposed to monolingual or bilingual learners, to try to identify structures in uh, a language that uh, wasn't real. It was just developed for purpose of experimentation and then compare how plurilingual learners, if they have advantages in, in learning new languages. And there's some very interesting work by McLaughlin and Nyack and Nation and McLaughlin uh, already at the end of the 80s on that. Um, and then there are other, um, there are more new um, approaches to, to plurilingualism research, which go into different areas of linguistics, for example, from a sociolinguistics perspective in Europe, there's been a lot of talk about, um, about translanguaging. And that's because that's a new approach, there's also new ways of going into that. So I guess uh, to sum up, um, there's a lot of ways uh, to look at plurilingual competence. And I think we need to look, because we can't, judge plurilingual competence in total, we look at different aspects which we think contribute to plurilingual competence and work on them. Thank you very much. The uh, next question from a viewer is um, that in your presentation you mentioned um, uh, the concept of plurilingualism as it is described in the CEFR and um, that in order to use that term at least uh, three languages uh, need to be uh, involved and uh, the question is when does actually a language count as one to which competence do you have to be able to speak or read or write um, or listen to it um, because um, as we heard um, um, many times during the symposium also so far in the concept of uh, plurilingualism it is not important to speak one language to perfection but where actually is the, the threshold that you would count it as one of those three languages? Oh, I'm getting questions today that I completely cannot answer. Um, because <laughs> again, again, it really depends on your perspective and what, uh, what uh, object, research object of interest is involved. So, um, being a plurilingual speaker in certain aspects, it also means working through different domains. And if I look, and I can really only look at one specific domain, one specific area at once. So I might be considered pluricultural if I can, um, if I can successfully um, communicate certain aspects within at least three languages, um, cultures. I might be considered plurilingual if um, I can. Uh, book a hotel room in different languages. Uh, I might be considered plurilingual only if I can give academic speeches in three languages. So it really also always depends on, on what the area of interest is. And I think the CEFR um, has gone into this very well by always emphasizing that how we see language and language competencies um, can't be seen as a one size fits all, but as something which is highly dynamic 
and something very much dependent on the situation we're interested in. Yeah, we see that this is also a topic uh, that uh, is uh, of interest to many. We have more questions, but unfortunately, because of the time, um, we need to uh, move on to the next topic. But thank you very much for these uh, valuable insights. Um, and uh, the last topic that um, we um, uh, that we deal with today is the connection between multilingualism and uh, society. And we are very happy that we could secure a Professor Hyun Hee Chong for this um, subject. She was introduced to us by the Korean Culture Center. She teaches Korean as a foreign language at high schools in Kanagawa and at the Korean Culture Center in Tokyo. The title of her presentation, which she will now uh, summarize, is Observations during a Korean language course for junior and senior high school uh, students. So this is something taking very much out of um, the, uh, the real life um, context. So um, yeah, um, I hand over to you and please once again, um, we welcome questions during the speech. Yes, I am Chung and I teach courses for junior and senior high school students at the Korean Cultural Center. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. I think I, 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 I hope you can hear me now. I am Chung and I teach courses for junior and senior high school students at the Korean Cultural Center. In my pre-recorded presentation, I talked about multilingualism in society. I introduced my course curriculum and how my students establish links with society. Now I would like to give you a summary of my talk. And I would like to share my slide. So if you can just wait a moment here. Our course started in 2011 and is sponsored by the Korean Cultural Center, King Sejong Institute and the Japan Forum. As you know, in Japan, the foreign language education, uh, yes, and um, we have targets in my course and we have uh, three terms um, over the year. So this is from 2019, the goals for each term. And we had four or five exchanges uh, with a Korean student. And it's not just exchanges, uh, sometimes uh, practicing together for a speech context took place. And the aim is to have students realize similarities and differences in their respective cultures res and respect those aspects and establish connections with society outside of their schools. And by participating in exchanges with students of the King Sejong Institute and mingling with people of different generations, we hope students will rediscover themselves and others and feel the links. This is uh, where students are practicing for the speech contest. Uh, they create a script and uh, they practice pronunciation. And the speech contest theme is about differences between Korea and Japan. Through group work, students deepen their understanding about others and the lang about others' language and thinking. There are 24 classes in a year. Students discover themselves and others, and through collaboration, they will realize the connection they have, and this will lead to new perspectives. And you can see this in the comments students made at the end of the course. Uh, this is actually the comments. Some say it's fun to read and write in Hangul, being able to introduce yourself and having that heard. After taking the course, some say they want to learn more Korean, learn more about the country or even study in Korea. So uh, there's a lot of comments from the students. 
The most important point is that students understand the world they know is not everything. By establishing links with people of different cultures, students can change and expand their knowledge. So far, I have explained about what happens inside the Korean Cultural Center. I would now like to talk about how the course helps students go out into the broader society. First, taking the course led students to take part in exchange programs for junior and senior high school students in Korea and Japan and establish links with people not just in Japan, but with Korean students of the same age. They can use Korean language and other things that they've acquired here in their collaborations. This course has influenced not just the course students, but also the Korean school students who participated in the exchange events. Korean school students may live in Japan, but their life is centered around their school, so they do not have opportunities to interact with Japanese citizens. Participating in the exchange events led them to feel they wanted to know more about other people. And this year, they took part in the multi-language, multi-culture uh, performance training camp by the Japan Forum and were able to gain new insights and create cross-border bonds. Some students after graduating high school became members of the speech contest organizing committee. By doing so, they were able to experience a society outside of school and gain real-world experiences. And I believe that provided new perspectives for them. And for some, taking this course led them to take Korean language courses in college and universities. Uh, some went to study in Korea. Of course, not all students will do so, but what started out of curiosity and interest has changed the future course for some students. The Korean pop culture boom that started in 2000 brought about changes in Korean language education in Japan. Although affected by the political situation in the two countries, the number of people who choose to learn Korean as a foreign language other than English at universities and private institutions have increased, as well as uh, high school students who want to uh, learn Korean has increased. But still, Korean is not a major language, so the learning opportunities at school is still very low. And this is not just for Korean, it is the same for other foreign languages other than English. I have talked about students' experience in learning Korean at the King Sejong Institute and how that affected them and their link with society. Students are full of diversity, so let's provide them with the opportunity to learn what languages other than English and help them develop into active citizens in the world. And that is all for myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, summary. Um, we have a first question here, um, which is um, uh, mentioning uh, uh, what you also said during your, your presentation that uh, sometimes um, uh, the language learning um, um, Korean language learning in Japan and Japanese language learning in Korea uh, is being affected by, by the political relations uh, between uh, both uh, countries. And the viewer um, says that in uh, his or her opinion, it is a very good approach to um, make people um, come together and um, make common efforts with the language. And the concrete question is, are there also similar approaches at uh, Korean schools uh, in, um, uh, in Korea um, to connect with um, Japanese students uh, directly and help to establish um, uh, the possibility to um, not only learn the language um, uh, with the help of the book, but to, to talk with each other. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, language education is not just about learning the language. I believe it is about 
uh, personal development uh, of uh, by learning that language and sharing that uh, knowledge together. Um, in Korea, since I am here in Japan, I don't know the details, but uh, students who are learning Japanese in Korea um, and students learning Korean in Japan, I, I do understand that they are using all kinds of tools to communicate with each other. Uh, for example, uh, they use Line or Zoom in classes uh, to collaborate. If they don't understand uh, what they're saying, sometimes you can use English. So English or Chinese or any language that the students uh, share. Uh, there were talks about a translation tool, but using everything possible to connect with each other. That's, I think, happening right now. Thank you. Yeah, that perfectly answers the next next question that I have here. That is actually um, if there are also third languages involved in case um, the Japanese and Korean skills are not enough to completely understand um, each other, uh, would there be also sometimes um, a use of English um, or um, uh, Chinese or another common language that uh, the students have um, have learned. Um, so the question is, is that something that, that you view quite often um, in these classes or is this something more rare and usually um, the most common languages are indeed Japanese and Korean? Well, yes, um, Japanese and Korean are what interests the students. So, yes, uh, students want to use Japanese or students want to use Korean. But if it, they find out that, that it's very difficult to communicate with each other, they will use a third language. It could be English or sometimes it may be Chinese. But uh, in my experience, students who learn here, um, when they try to have exchanges with students from Korea, uh, within the group, uh, sometimes when communication didn't flow well, they did try to use English or they used Chinese or they brought in a third person uh, to make the communication flow better. Not very often, but um, sometimes students tried to do that. I was able to see the students devise ways to communicate with each, with each other. Thank you. And I have um, one more question about the uh, um, young uh, Japanese um, learners and their impression of, um, of Korea um, and the, uh, the country so that everyone knows that um, uh, Korean um, uh, pop culture is, um, is also very popular among young people. But um, of course, uh, Korea has more than the, than the, the, the pop culture. And um, does this exchange also help to, um, to establish a, a more diverse picture of, um, of um, present day Korea? Uh, so this well, yes. During classes, uh, rather than me presenting uh, to the students, um, culture, of course, uh, is different from person to person. So now students are learning Korean. I'm not trying to push Korean culture to them. Uh, we are trying to see the different cultures uh, of different people. So the students, uh, through the exchanges, uh, they establish their own thinking about what culture is uh, through the discussions. And so they are learning from each other. And, and that actually comes out in the collaboration um, or in, the, uh, in certain events. Uh, I will not instruct them to do this or to that. Uh, students will find out from themselves. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion. And um, with this now we have reached uh, the end of the first day of, uh, of the symposium. Thanks very much to all the speakers and uh, participants for a very fruitful uh, event uh, so far. 
Um, and uh, we will continue um, tomorrow and uh, the program will also uh, feature uh, an interview with Eiji Kawashima, the goalkeeper of the Japanese national team, who himself masters uh, several languages and will talk about his interesting experiences. And we will have a, um, a, a great uh, panel discussion after that. Yeah, exactly. And with this panel discussion, we actually intend to go a bit more into detail concerning today's five topics. In preparation for the plenary discussion, there will be five workshops uh, featuring approximately 100 experts of multilingualism in Japan, and um, they uh, will uh, present their results during the plenary uh, discussion tomorrow. So I think there's a lot more to come. So please tune in again tomorrow. And as for now, please enjoy your evening or your day, whichever lies ahead. And yes, yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.